This, ladies and gentlemen, this is a scientist with his scientific tool, poking stick. From the day our ancestors used it to examine something beyond the reach, we have been building tools to study things that are too far away, or are too complex, or are too small. Take a look through a microscope, and a single drop of water becomes an entire world. I build tools to study systems that are too complex, our societies, the way people interact with each other, their social networks, how they move around. As a society, today, we have problems we desperately want to solve. We have to worry about infectious diseases, stability of our financial systems, spreading of hatred, racism, and xenophobia. But we can do so much better. We can bring the brightest minds to work together. We can spread good ideas across the world with a push of a button. We can begin to understand and address systemic biases and inequalities. But to do all that, to address existential threats and accelerate progress, we need deeper understanding, we need more guiding principles for how we humans function as teams, populations, and societies. The tool I build is called Living Labs. We scientists focus on a particular population, a school, a university, a workplace, a city, even a small country, and we ask people to let us observe them. We do this by instrumenting the environment, by collecting the online activity data that people give to us, by using publicly available data sources. But most importantly of all, we instrument participants themselves. Because what you know as a smartphone, to me is a powerful sensor, capable of continuous collection of where you are, with whom, how physically active you are, even when do you sleep. We might ask you to install an application on the phone or just give you the phone to participate. Now, I know that this feels uncomfortable to some of you. You perceive such tool as being extremely powerful. And you are right. Pointing a microscope at a society can lead to some really terrible things. We have been hearing about those things in the recent years with all the bulk data collection. But as a society, we have two paths in front of us. We can go to the left and decide that any progress in that direction, that trying to deepen our understanding of how societies work is simply not worth the risk, that we should stop any progress. The problem with such thinking is it has never really worked. Someone, somewhere, will be working on those tools. So we are most likely to go to the right and the question becomes, who controls the knowledge, the tools, and the application? So here I ask, what happens when we embrace the potential of better understanding of our societies? What happens when the good guys hold the microscope? In 2012, when I was doing my PhD at the Technical University of Denmark, in collaboration with MIT Media Lab, we did deploy such microscope, the largest today living lab, the Copenhagen Network Study. We bought 1,000 Android phones, installed a sensing application on them, and handed them out to our students. Those phones collected physical interaction data, who has been close to whom, and mobility data. You can see one day of such data here in the video, where every dot is a person. This is our campus. We also collected Facebook activity, who has been contacting whom, texting and calling metadata. We got extensive psychological and health profiles of the participants. And to top it off, we even had an anthropologist on the ground living with this population day in, day out, so we could get a better qualitative view of this population. All this together captured almost every single social interaction with this freshman population for a period of over two 
years. And of course, all this is done with students' full knowledge and consent. And this data is held by the researchers, and we are responsible for this. And we are responsible for who gets to look at this data and what to do with that. But thanks to that, we have this unprecedented view. And we can see how friendships form, change, and end. We can see how some people move to the center of their social networks, while others stay at the periphery. We can see how students work together. Let's see what we can do with that. Now, remember this scene in Apollo 13 movie, when they have to feed the square peg in this round hole using only the stuff that's available for the astronauts in, in their spacecraft. I mean, if you're anything like me, you just wish the entire movie was more of this scene. <laughs> so what they do, they just drop everything on the table and start going through that, looking for the right pieces. And in case you haven't heard about this story, they do succeed. Now, when we are dealing with trying to solve the problems in the society, we might be in a similar situation. We can do it, but we have to do it, do it using pieces of data that are available at large. And Living Labs offer us this opportunity to dump all this high-resolution data on a table and start going through that to see how we can solve the problems. And one of the problems, extremely important one, that we are trying to solve this way is spreading of infectious diseases. Now, here's the challenge. Imagine a super densely connected population. Uh, a school, a university, maybe your workplace. There is an outbreak of an infectious disease. It might be something relatively innocent, like seasonal flu. Or, you know, it might be something much more serious. <laughs> Today, we are facing basically two potential outcomes. We either close the entire school almost immediately, or pretty much everyone in this population gets sick. It's very hard to spot the outbreak early, and vaccinating everyone on time is often not feasible. But can we do better? Well, if we have a very detailed view of how people interact with each other, we can perform targeted vaccination and monitoring. It's called targeted because we choose a small sample of people that we want to observe or vaccinate. In case of monitoring, we want people that fall sick early and with high probability. So they provide a strong warning signal that something is going on. For vaccination, we want to reach people who are responsible for disproportionately high number of infections. So when we vaccinate them, the outbreak sizes go down dramatically. But the challenge remains. How do we find these people in a feasible way? Well, using this detailed data from Copenhagen Network Study, we found out that by vaccinating slightly less than a third of the population, we could expect to bring down the outbreak sizes by 80%. And that's great. But what is really important is we can get almost the same performance if for identifying the people, we use texting and Facebook networks. Those networks, the people that are most central in those networks, are the ones that we want to vaccinate. So now we are beginning to understand how this almost readily available data from Facebook or telco operators can give us this surprising insight into the structure of the population and, we can, and can help us to attack infectious diseases so we can do better than just closing entire schools. So we know we can collect the data and there are clearly use cases for it. The question is, how do we handle the complexity that comes with it? Because believe me, this is not simple data to deal with. Let's take a look at this. What is it? Is it a pile of trash, a movie set? Who already knows? Anyone? Ah, there are some people. Excellent. So we just look at this from a slightly different angle, and suddenly everything is clear, right? This is called anamorphic art, and you should really check it out. Just, you know, a few hours later, we'll be surprised it's night, it's night already. It's unclear from one angle and very clear from another. And we started dealing with the data, this complex data that came from the Copenhagen Network study. We found out a similar thing. So, first of all, we found out it's really complex. I mean, 
this network is just one day of interactions between the students. Every dot represents a person, every link is drawn if those people have been together at some point during that day. This is just one day, and we have over two years of such data. It's quite a herbal, right? And the thing is, such herbal very often doesn't really tell us that much. For many questions, we want to find structures in there, structures such as communities, your family, your friends, your other friends if you're really popular, your kayaking club. But finding those in such densely connected networks, social networks, has always been very hard. And adding more information, this information about temporal aspect, when the interactions happen exactly, only made the picture harder. So we couldn't really handle that. Until we realized that we can look at the problem from a different angle. Rather than fighting the complexity, we can embrace it. Rather than starting with this aggregate view, we can zoom in the microscope and look at the particular time slices, and those turn out to be really easy. This is a five-minute resolution time slice of the network, when the link is drawn between people if they have been together in this particular moment. I mean, you see those disjoint components. Those are meetings. You can literally point your finger at them. And there is no complex math necessary. And it turns out we can find those communities, family, friend, friends, by keeping track of those communities, uh, of those meetings over time. And we can see how they are born, how they change, and how do they end. And once we have those communities, we can see how people explore their environment in groups. We can see how predictable are our social interactions. Yes, it turns out that our social interactions, who do we meet? is actually highly predictable. We can see what behavior distinguishes real friends from Facebook friends. And all those things, those are fundamental building blocks, fundamental structures that we can use to answer those questions about well-being, team performance, epidemics. So living labs is not just about collection of more and more comprehensive data but it's also about developing mathematical frameworks to deal with this complexity. So what is next? Well, for sure we'll be able to collect more data. I mean, you know, smartphones right now, they have a coprocessor specifically to count your steps. And the moment this happened, this data became almost automatically part of what we can study about human behavior in those deployments. We will increase coverage and size. We did this Copenhagen network study a few years ago for 1,000 people. And to be perfectly honest, it was a little bit insane to do it back then. Today, we are venturing into tens of thousands of people. And by the end of the decade, we will see microscopes pointed at entire cities. And yes, this will create problems around privacy and how to responsibly use this data. But we are working on them. This is part of the development of the living labs. Remember, good guys holding the microscopes. But I think the most important development will come from the questions that we'll try to answer using living labs. Because you see, a tool is only as good as uses it is put to. I mean, a microscope sitting on a shelf is a said microscope. And you have so many ideas. People around the world are interested in so many things. You might be curious if open space in your workspace actually fosters interactions, or how long does it take for your family to adjust to daylight saving time, or how do we create better support networks for students at your university? Questions large and small, asked whether you are a researcher or not. Some of those questions are perfect to be answered with Living Labs fr framework. And we need these answers, and we need them coming from multiple places, so we can be sure that what we are seeing is true and that it generalizes. You see, nothing makes a toolmaker like myself more happy than an inquiry to use the tool. So if you have an idea that you think you could study this way, let me know. If you have an idea how to improve the microscope itself, you know where to find me. And yes, it will take duct tape, to actually make it up and running in your case. But the opportunity is just too huge to pass up. 
And I know these answers and these ideas will change the world. Thank you.